Okay. Good. I hope you call, saw a couple things by way of patterns. That um, really the speech divides into two parts. It opens with God asking rhetorical questions to Job, and then God goes on a while. Job comes back in chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. I am small, I have spoken once, but will proceed no further. And then God picks up again at uh, chapter 40, verse 6. Ask rhetorical questions, talks for a while, and then Job's second response, right at the end there, 42, 1 through 6. Okay? So it's God asks questions, speak, Job responds. God asks questions, speaks, Job responds. The verse counts are not equivalent. God gets 123 and Job gets 9. Now, you may have some questions about particulars, but I also at least want to try for us to get a range of possible ways to understand and respond to this speech. And remember, it's perfectly uh, acceptable to be uh, Satan's, or the devil's, advocate in this one. And I'll ask you a question to start us off. Has God answered Job's question? Now you might want to say, okay, what was Job's question? Fair enough? All right, let me give you this. Remember, um, Jim did this day. It's right back at the end of chapter 31 before Elihu comes on and Job says, if I've done anything wrong, show me what I've done. But I don't think I've done anything wrong. I've taken care of the poor and the orphan. If anybody needed help, I gave that person help. Show me what I have done wrong to deserve this, namely his suffering. We've talked about all those Job moments that um, happened just in the beginning, beginning of the whole book. And so Job at the end of chapter 31 says this, Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. That's verse 35 in chapter 31. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. His question is, I'm calling you to court to tell me what I've done wrong so that I am suffering the way I am suffering. So really, I think, Job is asking the question, why? Why am I suffering? And my question to you is, does God answer that question? God says, let me explain it this way, shut up. <laughs> God says, let me explain it this way, shut up. Okay. Uh, William Sapphire, who wrote a book, Sam, that I know you know and like, called The First Dissident, which is about the book of Job, says that God's answer is, because I'm God, that's why. Which is just a, a slightly more polite version of, uh, I'm God, you shut up. And this has led some people to say, remember we're going to get a range of interpretations out here, um, that God is bullying Job. Uh, that he's putting him in his place. And I, I admit, I was kind of leading you to that when I talked about 123 verses versus 9 verses. Um, good. There's one possible, and that's not going to be a single interpretation. We can put that on a side of a spectrum. Uh, because I'm God, that's why. Because I'm God, shut up. God bullying Job. One of the things I want you to do to think about with me is, and this is going to be part of getting a good interpretation of this book, First, how do we make sense of Job's responses? It may only be nine verses, but still they're important nine verses. Now it could just be, Sam, as you said, um, I quit, game over, you're bigger and stronger. Though, Sam, I'm going to challenge you a little bit, that's not quite what he says. So one of the things we might want to do is look at some care, detail, with what Job actually says. Also, I want you to think about, does what God says, say in the first part of the whirlwind speech, how does that relate to what he says in the second part of the whirlwind speech? 
And we can review that. So to some degree, I think the answer, perhaps not the devil, but the answer is in the details here uh, as to how we make sense of it. But certainly, that one family of interpretations, God as cosmic bully, uh, has been raised before and is worth our considering. Good, Sam, go ahead. Right. And uh, what I'm working on is, what is that message that Job got? How does Job understand God's whirlwind speech? Don't question what God does. <laughs> Don't question what God does. Well, look at what he says. Go back to, it's all the way at the end. It's the very last page of your handout. And I'll read it to you. Um, uh, page 13 of your handout. I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Now he's quoting God back to God at that point, because that's the way God began the whole speech. Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. Again, verse 4 is really just Job quoting God back to God. That's what you said. And then Job picks up in his own voice in verse 5, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now there's one thing I want to warn you about, and this is where I want to um, save some of the good stuff for Jim. 42.6 has been one of the most discussed verses in the Bible it opens up a range of possible interpretations. Again, our NRS, NRSV has, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Let me just give you a few possibilities, and Jim will come back and talk about the Hebrew in more detail. Therefore, I retract my words and repent of dust and ashes. Now that's different. Because that's what's saying, I take back what I said, but I have been wearing symbols of mourning, and I reject those symbols of mourning. That's almost the exact opposite of I repent in dust and ashes. In a way, what this one is saying is, by repenting of the symbols of mourning, it's almost like the old, old days, you know from your 19th century, um, a widow would have to wear signs of mourning a black cap, a black band around her, um, but there came a certain point when she could take them off. That's what, according to one translation, Job is saying in verse 6, I'm taking off my mourning clothes. But still a couple more. Therefore, I reject and forswear dust and ashes. Now notice this, he's not, this third possibility is not saying I retract my words, but it's saying I reject and I repent or forswear of all the symbols of mourning. Here's still another one. I'll try to go slowly. Therefore, I retract my words and have changed my mind concerning dust and ashes. That is, changed my mind concerning the human condition. Still another one. Therefore, I retract my words and I am comforted concerning dust and ashes, i.e. comforted about the human condition. Now those are different, and I can try to do them again uh, slowly if you have questions about them. But you can see some of them, especially when you talk about Job rejecting dust and ashes, seem to be Job saying, I am no longer sorrowful which is very different from what the NRSV says, because with the way the NRSV translates it, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes, says I'm sorrowful, but it says especially I'm penitent. I'm sorry for what I did. Okay, we're just getting warmed up. Okay, good. Questions about this, Beth? It seems to me in the first part, God is talking about the cosmic good. He created the world. Okay. Okay. And my understanding is that um, probably flawed. That's okay. Is that that 
Job comes to understand or to see the powerful nature of God and to focus on that rather than on himself. Okay. And so he he's comforted by the fact that God is in charge of the world. And, and the, 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 that he's focused on his misery and not on glorifying. Okay, there's two different points here, and I, I want to make sure everybody heard. The, the, the acoustics are good in this room. But um, I think your first point related to um, what God talks about. If, it, if we don't just get overwhelmed by the speech, can we see some kind of pattern in it? Does he move in any logical way, God, from topic to topic? And I'll address that in a second. But your other point was, is there some kind of change in Job's vision? that Job, whereas before he had been focused on himself, is now focused on God. Let me do the first part first of your point. Um, one of the neat things to watch here is exactly the development of God's speech. One of the things I think you can see if you look early, go back to like page two, three of your handout. If you don't have one, we're out, but you can, um, page one, two, and three, you can even see it in one. Just start 38.4. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Or go to 38.8. Do you see this still on page 1? Or who shut in the sea with doors? When I made the cloud its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it, and set bars and doors. And then go over to page 2. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, so that it may take hold of the skirts of the earth? Look down at 16. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked into the recesses of the depth? Or verse 19. Where is the way to the dwelling of light and where is the place of darkness? Surely you know. A little sarcasm here in 21. For you were born then and the number of your days is great. But then go to page 3, verse 22, 38, 22. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail? which I reserve for time of trouble. Have you cut a channel, verse 25, for the torrents of rain? 28, has the rain a father who has begotten the drops of dew? Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? What people seem to say here is God is saying there are cosmic boundaries. In fact, there are whole regions of the cosmos that you have no idea about. So first theme that God talks about is the universe is way bigger than you are and than your knowledge of it, Job. But notice, it's not just that it's way bigger, but did you notice there's all this sense of shutting up, enclosing, giving its limits, so that there are boundaries to all things. And we move from cosmic boundaries to what you might call meteorological boundaries, right? The storehouses of the snow, um, the place where the hail is kept. Um, and then we go to one more thing. Um, this is all in the first half of the speech before Job says anything. We go to what's the animal kingdom. But again, notice, when God does speak of the animal kingdom, God does not just go, help me, kingdom, phyla, genus, species. I'm looking for my uh, science majors to help me. I had to memorize this. Uh, class, order, family, genus, species. Uh huh reason he got into med school. All right, good. Um, does God do that? Uh-uh. What does God do? God talks about the ostrich, the wild donkey, and the horse. And, and use your memory banks, but you got it in front of you. Look, what does God seem to be saying about the ostrich, the wild donkey, and the horse? Or the lion, for that matter. We're now in um, verses, uh, chapter 39 especially. The wild ass, the mountain goats, the wild ox. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they don't tear, take care of their young. The ostrich neglects her egg. She just leaves it in the sand for anybody to stomp on. But still, that egg hatches and ostriches continue. I did not give her wisdom. She has no measure of wisdom. 
But have you ever seen her run? She can put horse and rider to shame when she lifts her wings and begins to run. Well, what is this? I think, see, when we get to the animal kingdom, it's variation on a theme. <coughs> Just as if there are regions of the universe beyond your comprehension that are nonetheless controlled and ordered, so there's parts of the animal kingdom that are way beyond your control, but that I have ordered and nonetheless come under my control. So if you look at chapter 39, uh, verse 5, this is on page 5 of your handout. 